Welcome to this ACCA F7 financial reporting for the international version. And now let's see in this particular section how we're going to study F7 effectively and how APC can help with your F7 exam. So first of all, the exam format of the uh, F7 will be um, 3 hours and 15 minutes reading time. It will be divided into two sections of example the section A. We've got 20 multiple choice questions total about six, uh, 40 marks and the section B will be three questions uh, to prepare for the financial statement uh, total at 60 marks. So that's the exam structure of the F7 and then looking at the content uh, of the F7 study. So here for the APC we'll divide the syllabus into five chapters. So the chapter one is we're going to look at why do we need financial reporting. I mean, as we may be aware of, that the financial reporting is all about the financial accounting. So, financial accounting, all we need to do is where we're going to record the business transactions using debit as well as credit, and those business transactions have already taken place within the organisation already. So that means the financial reporting, all we can do is going to record all those business transactions and we'll summarise them together into a paper. And that paper is called a financial statement. And of course, in our F3, we know that we will have to go through a series of steps when we prepare the financial statement. For example, we need to get the source document, such as the invoice. I will post that into the books of Pymenche, such as the sales day book and purchase day book. And then we're going to post the total balance into the ledger account, which is the T account. And we end up with the closing balance and we slot that into a child balance, doing the year end adjustment, such as the depreciation, that kind of thing. And finally, we prepare for our financial statement. For example, your balance sheet, or you can call it as a statement of financial position, a statement of loss and other comprehensive income, statement of change in equity, as well as the cash flow. So those will be the things that we will look at in the F7 course. So should I say that the F7 is very, very practical? So it's very, very useful uh, if you are the financial accountant in the real life. So that's the very, very good uh, paper that we are studying here. So why financial reporting exists? Well, as I said, our aim is to record what has happened within our organisation. And that means what has happened, for example, we decide to invest our $10 million into buying the property plant equipment because our aim for that, let's say, uh, we'd like to be a market leader within this industry and hence buying this high-tech property plants equipment for example, the machinery for example, we can be the leader within this industry. So that's the management activity isn't it? That's something to do with the strategy. So that means because of the management activities happened and then from the financial accountants we are going to record all those activities that has already taken place. So that means for example we spend 10 million dollars into buying the property plants equipment so from the financial accountants perspective we will debit, which means increase the property plant equipment by $10 million and we spend the cash out to buy it so that we credit to decrease the cash by $10 million. So that's how we do it. So that means, for example, in this case, that we debit the PPA. So you can think about it like the machinery and we credit the cash from our bank worth of 10 million. So that is because of the monthly activity taking place and our aim for that, our job, is to record what has happened. So that's the F7. So that's the reason why we need to have the financial reporting. We are showing the position of the organisation, for example, how many assets that we've got, that's at the year end, for example, 31st December. And we're going to report that to our shareholders 
because we are acting on behalf of a shareholder. They employ us as a director and we act on behalf of them. And also we're going to tell them how, uh, how much profit that we've made during the year. For example, we've sold those goods to a customer and we've made, for example, $10 billion of the profit. And we're going to say to them we've made $10 billion worth of profit. And that's it. So that's what I mean by financial reporting. And hence, you know that concept already. Now, for the financial reporting, as we can see, we are recording the transactions onto the financial statement. So, if we were to record the transactions onto the financial statement, for example, you can think about it in this way. In the previous example, we are going to say, well, we buy the property plant equipment that worth of $10 million. Okay, let me just change the scenario a little bit here. So if we were to buy that uh, property plant equipment, we'll say that, well, th this property plant equipment onto the invoice, the price is to be $10 million. I will have to pay tax on that uh, property plant equipment as well because we've imported that property plant equipment from India and we're based in Hong Kong. So as a result of it, we're going to pay for another $1 million for the taxes as well, for those, um, I mean, the uh, duties, as you can see, it's the taxes. Um, not only for that, in order to use that property plant equipment, uh, we also signed agreements with the supplier, and uh, they are responsible for the maintenance for that property plant equipment, for, the, for that high-tech machinery for us, and hence the maintenance, cost is to be two million dollars so if that's the case then as you can see uh, because the amount of activity is taking place in the first place for example we decide which supply that we're going to choose that's something to do with our supply chain management and then we pay for the taxes worth of one so that's related to the taxation in your F6 of your study and also we negotiate with that supplier to be $2 million worth of its maintenance annually for our property plant equipment. But when we buy the property plant equipment from that supplier, what is the value here? So either we're going to put 10 or 10 plus 1 or perhaps 10 plus 1 plus 2 here. What do you think then? Well, in order to answer this question, we have to learn the second part, which is the accounting standards here. So the accounting standards we are learning uh, are from the IESB, it's the International Accounting Standards Board, and they set to those uh, international accounting standards, or the updated words, the updated term for this, is the International Financial Reporting Standard. So what we need to do then is where we're going to use the rules or principles within these accounting standards to guide us through of what is the value that we're going to put onto the financial statement. So in this case, as you can see, we're going to put 10 plus 1 here, so that would be 11 million. And also we spend the cash out for that 11 million dollars here. So you may have a question, well Steve, why are we going to do that? Well, according to the IAS number 16, which is the property plant equipment, so, of course, we'll learn that in detail in a second, don't worry. So, we are saying that we are putting the property plant equipment as an asset to our organisation because you buy that machinery, that becomes your asset. So, if that's the case then, using the historical costs, we are capitalising, so that means we are recognising something as an asset worth of 10 and also 1. Because, as you can see, if we were not to pay for this $10 million here, I mean, we cannot have this asset, yes? So that means this $10 million, because we've paid for it, because we signed contract, and hence that becomes our asset, and we can control it. And the expense can be reliably measured, so that means it's $10 million that we spend, and hence we create the cash out. And also for this tax, if you don't pay for this tax of one, that asset cannot be shipped from that local, that foreign country, so for example India, to Hong Kong. You have to pay for the government related to it, otherwise you cannot have this asset on hand. 
And as a result of it, because those expenses will bring the asset into the present location, that means shipping from India to Hong Kong, and also the present condition. And that means by having by paying for this 10 million, the ownership of the asset belongs to our company. And hence referring to the asset definition, all we need to do is we simply capitalize that eleven million dollars here. But for the maintenance expense worth of two million dollars, it stays. If you use that asset, fine, you use that. But if you decide not to maintain um, the assets, so that means if you're not spending that two million dollars into maintain that asset, so that means the asset will not be uh, as efficient as you think it will be in the first place. And as a result of it, this is not the necessary expense that we incur into bringing the asset into the present location and condition. And as a result of it, according to the accounting standards number 16, all we can do is we say we spend the cash out of $2 million into paying for that supplier, into maintenance our, our property plant equipment, but that we're going to recognize it as the expense worth of $2 million rather than capitalizing or recognizing this $2 million as an asset onto our statement of financial position in the first place. So that's the logic behind it. I hope you're absolutely happy with it. So that means when we are recording a transaction from the financial accountant's perspective, we have to follow the accounting standard, otherwise we cannot recognize, uh, we cannot record those transactions correctly. So after we followed all those accounting standards that we will mention, quite a lot of these accounting standards that we're going to learn. So after we study them, we will summarize all those operating results into number three, which is the published account. So what do I mean by published account? So account means financial statement. So for example, it can be the balance sheet or the statement of loss or the statement of change in equity or the cash flow. So those will be accounts. So we're going to publish them. Why? Because, I mean, in the annual general meeting with the shareholders, because we're going to report to those shareholders what is the operating results within our company, how much profit that we've made in the first place, that kind of thing. Of course, we're going to publish all those financial statements and tell them, well, you see, here are those financial statements, no problem, and those reflect um, how well our company is operating during the year. So that's what I mean by published account. So that means we are going to summarize all those records that we recorded in the first place because of monthly activities. We are recording those activities and summarize them into a set of financial statements together and we'll publish them to the shareholders. So that's the number three. And once we look at the published account, the number four here is to look at the consolidation because we are working within the big company or large company. So we've got lots of these subsidiaries within our group. So what do I mean by group is this? As you can see, here is the group and we've got the parents company. So it's the largest company here. And then under which we will have the subsidiary. So what we need to do then, not only we're going to prepare for the published account for the parents company, for the subsidiary company, but also what we need to do is we're going to add them up together. We're going to add those assets liabilities together, and we're going to add those income as well as the expense together, and that will become our group financial statement. So that's the idea behind it, and hence when we are looking at the consolidation here, we are looking at how we're going to add those assets liabilities together and how we're going to split the equity between the parent and the subsidiary. And of course, by splitting that equity into the subsidiary, that's called the non-controlling interests. I can call it the minority interests, as the previous terms is the minority interests, but now it's the non-controlling interests. And after we look at those, the final chapter that we're going to see how we prepare for the statement of cash flow. So what do I mean by statement of cash flow is this. For example, 
uh, within your bank account, you see the, the bank balance during this year, as at the year event, is to be $100. But the bank balance, for example, last year, is just to be $40. So the bank balance is increased by 60 here, you agree? Why this is the case then? So if you simply look at the, um, the bank balance within your statement of financial position, you know that last year's $40 worth of cash, but now it's 100 You don't know the reasons why. You don't know how much money that the company uh, has put into buying those non-current assets, or perhaps how much money that the company has got in selling those property plant equipment, for example, selling the land to the third party in the first place. So that's the reason why we will prepare for the cash flow statement or you can call it as the statement of cash flow and detailing that $60 of increase in cash. Perhaps that $60 of increase will be because of the operating activities. So that means why this $60 of increase in cash is simply because that you sold that inventory during the year and you realize that $60 worth of cash. Or perhaps it will be because of the investing activities. And that means, for example, that you've invested your money into um, buying the property plant equipment and hence decreasing the, um, the cash within your company because you spend the money buying it. Or perhaps $6 of increase will be because of the financing activity, because that you've borrowed some money from others and hence increased your cash by $60. So that's the reason why we're going to show this movement of $60 into three reasons. So that's according to the IAS number seven. So we're going to explain that in a second, don't worry. So we're required to prepare the statement of cash flow to show to the user why it is in movement of cash between last year and this year. So that's the reason uh, why we're going to do it. Okay. And also we are required to interpret the financial statements as well, for example, if I say to you, our company has made profit $100, we're not this good or bad. Well, perhaps $100, I mean, we've made the sales revenue, for example, is $1 million, but we only make profit $100. Of course, it's bad, yeah? But if, for example, our companies make the sales revenue worth $110, and out of which $100 will be related to profit, and that to me is relatively good, isn't it? So that means we're going to calculate quite a lot of these ratios related to interpretation part. For example, related to profitability, we calculate the gross profit margin, operating profit margin, or net profit margin, or related to liquidity, or perhaps related to gearing, or related to efficiency, and also some of the investors ratio as well, such as the earnings per share ratio that we are required to know. So, that's the syllabus of the F7, as you can see. It's so practical. If you learn this F7 course solidly, of course, you will be a qualified accountant uh, for uh, quite a lot of these issues uh, happens in the real life uh, quite easily. So that's the F7 course. So that's for the F7 introduction. And now let's see how APC can help with your F7 course here. So our F7 course is the live online driven course and that means before you watch the virtual classroom interactive sections such as this related to tuition as well as the revision, you'll be invited to uh, join the live online courses directly with our tutor live online. It's like in a real classroom and we'll help you setting up your study plan and also helping you uh, to see how you can succeed in the F7 course by focusing on the exam techniques and also the questions that might come up in the exam and how you can best use of your study resources in order to succeed in the F7 course. And of course, before the exam, we will give you a mock exam paper. We will predict what would come up in the exam in the upcoming sitting and do the mock exam under exam condition and scan your answer and send that to our tutor and we're going to mark it for you. And very importantly, we'll provide the tutor support as well. If you've got any questions during your study, don't hesitate to contact our tutor and we'll 
give the answer. And we will answer your questions as soon as possible. So that's the end for the F7 introduction. I hope you find this section very interesting and useful. Look forward to seeing you in the F7 course. APC, accounting for your future.